Well, good morning. What a privilege to be here leading worship this morning. And good morning to everyone who is watching from wherever you're watching. Together, we are the family of God, the people of God, met uh, online, on, on CD listening and in person. Let's to praise his name, to give him thanks, to bring to him our prayers and concerns and to make sure, most definitely, that it's he who gets the glory this morning. So as we begin our worship together, we begin with words from Isaiah chapter 40. Words that make sure that we come with the right attitude this morning. So reading from verse 25. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal? says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each one of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Why do you complain, O Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, my cause is disregarded by my God? Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths God grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. What wonderful words about our God, the everlasting, and we bring our prayers to him now, this everlasting God. Let us pray. Father God, we praise you, and just in saying that, we know that our words are so limited, are so inadequate, because we want to give you the glory this morning. Yours is the glory, the majesty, the power and the dominion. And we praise you, Father God, that you have seen fit to send Jesus to us so that we might have a relationship with you, almighty God, majestic God, awesome God. We praise you. We adore you. We praise you because you have dealt with us so very, very kindly. We praise you that in our sin, you sent Jesus to us, to redeem us, to point us in the right direction, to give us a way back to you. And Father God, we are in awe that you should do that for each one of us. Because we know, Lord, that we do grow weary. We do complain. We do look for you in places where we cannot expect you to be. Because they are not within your will and not within your purpose. Father God, this morning we ask that you would um, cleanse us from our sins. That we would come to you knowing how... Badly we have fallen short and knowing that in you we find forgiveness and hope and a fresh start. So Father God, be with us now as we bring to you our confession for the things that we have done that we shouldn't have done. For the things that we have said that we shouldn't have said. For those things that we have not done and said when our intervention would have made a difference. Father God, we're sorry. 
And we ask that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would cleanse us. You would heal us. That you would wipe the slate clean. And we thank you that your word promises that, so that we can have that assurance. So Father God, help us this morning to praise you. Praise you as we ought, because you are worthy. Help us to bring our thanksgiving to you for the very breath that we breathe, for our life, for this beautiful, amazing world you have given us to enjoy. Help us to have grateful hearts. And Father God, help us in this time of worship to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. For we come to you in this Christian act of worship to worship him, our Saviour, our Redeemer, and our Lord, and it is in his name, his precious name, that we bring our prayers this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And we say together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It is our joy and our privilege to sing the praises of our God. And if we're worshipping online, we get to sing them out loud. And if we're worshipping in person, we get to sing them in our hearts. But how wonderful that however we come to our God, he meets us as we praise his name. And so we share together this beautiful song, The Splendour of the King.
it is in that context where we get a glimpse of how great our God is that we bring to him our prayers of intercession. This is such a privilege to bring our prayers for the places and people who are on our hearts that concern us. And so we come to God knowing that he is a great God, that he is bigger than any of the issues that we bring to him this morning. There's a response um, to our prayers this morning as we think about our prayers in the context of God's kingdom. So when I say, your kingdom come, would you please respond, your will be done. So when I say, your kingdom come, please respond, your will be done. And so let's pray. Father God, we are grateful and we praise your name that you are great. You are the name above all names. That you are higher than any other. And so it is in that context that we can come to your throne confidently to bring our prayers for situations and people who have touched us. And Lord, in all our prayers this morning we pray your kingdom come, your will be done. We praise you and thank you, Lord, for this amazing world in which you have placed us. And Father, we know that it is not the place you intended it to be. And we bring to you the places that we see on our television screens and our news reports that are full of the sin that means that people live in poverty, that they fear for their lives, that there is injustice. In particular, Lord, we bring to you today all those in Miami who are affected by the collapse of the apartment block. We think about those working and we pray for those who are waiting. Your kingdom come, your will be done. We praise you, Lord, that we live in a democratic country. And we pray, Lord, for the government, for our MP. For all those who have decisions to make that affect us. And Lord, in particular, this week we pray for the Methodist Conference meeting in Birmingham. We pray for the new president, Sonia Hicks. We pray for all those who will be ordained today. And Lord, we pray for those for whom this ordination day holds very special and dear memories. We pray that the decisions of the conference, decisions that affect all of us, will be made with your wisdom and integrity. Your kingdom come, your, your will be, be done. done. And Father, we pray for the place in which you have put us, for our, our local church and community, that wherever we are, we would be a witness to the joy and the love and light we have found in knowing you. We pray for those for whom we have come to pray for this morning. Those we love who are in hospital or who are struggling at home. Those who feel helpless and hopeless. Those who feel weary. 
and those who have not experienced the joy that knowing you brings. Your kingdom come, your will be done. And so, Father God, we bring all the prayers of our hearts to you now. And Lord, we trust you to answer our prayers because you hear our prayers. And we ask that we would see the answers to our prayers unfolding and not put it down to a coincidence or one of those things, but down to your goodness and your kindness and give you the glory. In Jesus' name we ask this and all our prayers. Amen. Amen. Our reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark. It is a reading that will be familiar to some of us as it is about the daughter of Jairus and how he comes to Jesus, approaches Jesus to ask that he heals his daughter. It has in it as well that meeting of Jesus with the woman who has been ill for several years. And while you're listening to Lydia read this reading, I wonder if you could put yourself in the shoes of any one of those characters that you will hear in the story. I wonder if you would identify with anybody that you um, here. So instead of just hearing the reading this morning and letting it in some way to wash over us, I invite you to be proactive in your listening. That you really listen not just to the words, but what God is saying to you through the words of Scripture this morning. After the reading, there will be an opportunity for you to reflect on the reading again while some quiet music is being played. You've been given a reading, uh, the reading as you came to church this morning, and if you're looking online, do they have a reading too, Mark? No, but I'm, I'm wondering if you could grab a Bible, or if you could just stop for a moment and think about those words and what they mean to you. So we're going to have the reading and then some quiet time of reflection. Thank you. The reading is from Mark chapter 5, verses 21 to 43. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for twelve years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak, because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realised that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, 
Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, Don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in to where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talakum, which means, Little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was twelve years old. At this they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. Thanks be to God for his word. As we continue to reflect on what that reading means for each of us, where we are in the picture, we're going to sing a beautiful worship song that reminds us that the Jesus that we have just read about, the Jesus we have just heard about, 
is the Jesus who meets with us now by the power of his Holy Spirit. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus, what a beautiful man. followed by Jesus' baptism, his temptation in the desert, and the call of the fishermen disciples. And that's just chapter one. It is not surprising that the Monday evening Bible study group, who started studying Mark last September, have at the last count reached chapter 13, but still with plenty more action to come. It's as if we can feel that Mark was so excited to record Jesus' story. Mark then goes on and takes us into Jesus' public ministry. Jesus confronting a demon, healing a leper, forgiving and healing the paralyzed man, the start of the conflict with the Jewish leaders and authorities. Jesus calming the storm and driving out demons. Which brings us to the second half of chapter 5, where we're now going to pause, catch our breath, and look a little longer and deeper at the story that we have just heard. This is a story within a story 
the story of two daughters, the story of the desperate woman set within the story of Jairus and his dying daughter. The stories belong together, and Mark creates some real drama and tension by telling them in this way. So let's have a look at this story. I wonder where you are in it. Did you feel as if we were in the crowd, or on the edge of the crowd, looking in? Did you relate to a particular character or characters? Did you fall at Jesus' feet and tell him your story? So let's start by thinking about the crowd who were gathered. Why were they there? They knew Jesus was coming. They couldn't wait. But wait for what? Possibly to be entertained to see another one of his miracles. They had heard that Jesus had done it before. They were excited about seeing what he might do. They wouldn't have known for sure who Jesus really was then, but they knew that things happened when he was around. And maybe at this point they saw him as more of a spectacle than as a saviour. Of course, we don't from this story know what anyone in the crowd was actually thinking or feeling that day. Maybe some were there because they had nothing better to do that day. Others may have been dragged along by a friend who wanted a bit of company and moral support. Perhaps some were curious as to what all the fuss was about. So, our first challenge is, are we in the crowd? Just along for the ride? Curious? Wanting to be entertained? No strings attached, no commitment. Maybe Jesus is trustworthy? Maybe he isn't. Maybe on some days I'll follow. Maybe on some days I won't. Perhaps we're still searching and have questions that need answers. It's okay to be in the crowd. We all have our own journey to get to know Jesus, which is at our own speed. And he is patient. Our second challenge is maybe we identify more with Jairus. Now Jairus wasn't there that day to be entertained. As a synagogue leader, he was part of the Jewish establishment. An establishment which was hostile to and untrusting of Jesus. However, Jairus put his pride to one side, forgot his fears of religious controversy, all the trouble he might get into to fall at Jesus' feet. He was feeling desperate and in that desperation when he had no other options left to save his precious much loved daughter he put his trust in Jesus and begged for help. But just when he got Jesus' attention their journey is delayed. This must have been an agonising wait for Jairus. We can only imagine how he must have felt when he heard that heartbreaking news that his daughter had died. He could have walked away in despair, but he didn't. Jesus tells Jairus in verse 36, Do not be afraid, just believe. And against all the evidence to the contrary, Jairus does. He goes with Jesus and witnesses his daughter being brought back from death. Wow! Wow is what he must have thought, what faith he must have had then. What powerful testimony he could give to others. So, can we identify with Jairus? Are we able to put our pride to one side and fall on our knees at Jesus' feet? Or do we think we can cope with all that life throws at us by relying on our own resources? Do we only approach Jesus when we are desperate, with no other options left? 
Why would we leave it that late? When we could be having a relationship with Jesus all the time. Would we turn our back on Jesus when the news is the worst possible and we think the situation is helpless? Sometimes maybe we give up on God too soon and don't give him time to work that miracle in our lives. God works on his timings, not ours, and he knows what is best for us. So this morning, are we in the crowd? Are we more like Jairus possibly? Or maybe we are like the woman. This woman, who is not named, would have been an outcast in her society. According to Jewish law, her medical condition would have made her ritually unclean, isolating her from most human contact not only was she seen as unclean, but she would make unclean anyone that she touched. But there she was, desperate, with no other option to believe that by touching Jesus' clothes, she would be healed. Verse 28 is a great statement of faith. If I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Just like Jairus, she put her trust in Jesus. Even though she has this faith in Jesus' healing power, she approached from behind whilst remaining hidden in the crowd. It must have required such a great effort. She had spent so many years avoiding touching people and because she is unclean, she believes her touch will render Jesus unclean too. This woman cannot in her wildest dreams imagine that Jesus would welcome her touch. But she is rewarded for her brave faith. Her plan was to melt back into the crowd, but Jesus had a different idea. He knew who had touched him and received healing. But he asked that question, who touched me, so that the woman could be blessed. Jesus didn't call her out to embarrass her, although it might seem that way from the story. He wanted her to hear it from him, that she was healed, and why. She needed to hear that her touch on its own was useless. It was because of her faith that it became so powerful. Verse 34. Daughter, your faith has healed you. This was a special blessing. Jesus never called any other person daughter. So are we the woman in this story this morning? Are we desperately, desperately in need of Jesus for him to do something for us, to intervene in our lives? Have we told him what's going on so that he can do that for us? Do we feel brave enough to tell Jesus the whole truth about our sin, our suffering, the other cures we have tried, our hopes, our needs. Our encounter with him will be so much more if we tell him everything. Do we need to rid ourselves of the thought that we are not good enough to approach him? Can we come face to face with Jesus so that we can give him the opportunity to have the relationship he wants to have with us. So that he can bless us and call us daughter or son or child.
So I, I think this morning that this can all be summed up by what Jesus says in verse 36. Do not be afraid, just believe. This is a story about faith, but it's much, much more than that. It's about fear and faith and the power of Jesus to take people from one to the other. So what can we learn about faith, not fear, from this story? It was those words from Jesus in verse 36 that struck me most when we were looking at this passage for today. I've had to hear those words, do not be afraid, just believe, many, many times since I started my local preaching journey. And I know that I will continue to need to hear them. I have to try to just believe that God wants me to do this. That he will equip me to do this. And that he will put the right people in my path to help me do this. And he will not let me fail. Even though I am out of my comfort zone and afraid. The Bible has many, many examples of God saying, do not be afraid. Why? Because fear paralyzes us. It gets in our head, sticks our feet to the floor. It stops us thinking clearly and prevents us from seeing the bigger picture that has God at the center. So when we're paralyzed by fear, we can't focus on God. And then there's the just believe. Believe what? The great news that our God is big enough to deal with our fears and our failures and will always love us no matter what. And to believe that Jesus wants a relationship with us. Not just when we're desperate and at the end of our tether. If we can only see Jesus as our last chance saloon, we risk missing out on the relationship we could be having with him all the time. So maybe you don't identify with any of the characters in this story today. Maybe you just need to hear, do not be afraid, just believe. But wherever you are in this story, or nowhere in this story, the really good news, the best news, is that Jesus is in the story. And he is the same yesterday today and forever. And that is the best news. Mm. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word to us this morning. And pray that it will speak to each one of us in the way that we need to hear it. Whether that gives us some answers to some questions, whether that gives us some questions to ask, whether there was something there that we needed to challenge us, or something to, to comfort us. Perhaps we need to hear Jesus calling us daughter, of a son or child. We pray that you would help us to put our fears to one side and to not be afraid and to just believe to fall at Jesus' feet and to trust him and tell him everything so that we can have that relationship with him that he so desperately wants us to have. 
And we ask this prayer in his precious name. Amen. Amen. Our final song today reminds us that this God that we have met goes before us, that he is with us, that we have been blessed in our worship this morning, and that is because we are called to be a blessing to other people. So as we go, we sing, God, you.
in the power of your Holy Spirit to live and to work to your praise and glory. And the people of God said, Amen.